gospel readings this evening is from the 6th chapter of Matthew. We're going to start at verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to conclude with verses 16 through 21. You can follow that on page 5 in the New Testament part of your, of your pew Bibles. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces as to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words from my mouth and meditations of our hearts be accepted to O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Our Ash Wednesday service is full of rich symbols. We have the purple pyramids that signal the beginning of Lent. We have the ashes on the altar that mark repentance, seeking forgiveness. When Job was in, in Job's story, we know that one of the things he did was to mark himself with ashes, sackcloth and ashes. Ashes are a known sign of repentance. So the ashes on the, on the table before us are a strong symbol about why we do what we do. And with the imposition of ashes, we are reminded that our faith, our church and our worship life has much outward symbolism. Now the gospel scripture for our time together this Ash Wednesday is one of those passages that, that seems to go against the very fabric of Ash Wednesday as we understand it. Now we might be tempted at first reading to wonder if the marking of ashes is something that Jesus would call hypocritical. Many things we do in worship can be called into question. Just the collection of the offering could be, if abused, a way of puffing ourselves up or bragging about ourselves. Or it could be a way of saying, woe are we, we simply don't have the money. It is an outward symbol that calls attention to what God says should just be ordinary parts of living. Now, many of the practices Jesus refers to were common in public places where followers of the faith made a very public witness to their faith. Jesus refers to the synagogues and the street corners, the private and the public. And I cannot in good conscience dismiss the idea that just because we do these things within the walls of the church, 
that Jesus' admonition, Jesus' caution, does not apply to us this evening. For as the beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday represents the start of a season of what is to be deep introspection and correspondingly deep movement toward a different way of living. Now in verse 5, where that beautifully condemning word hypocrite pops up in most translations, it is a reminder that no matter where we are, in any circumstance, others are watching. And that we must be careful that our faith example isn't playing to the crowd or on our own bent toward proving our self-righteousness. With the references to doing things in private or out of eyesight to others, we wonder how that relates to the teaching in chapter 15, chapter 5, verses 14 and 16, that we are not to hide our light but put it out there so everyone can know that God is real and worthy of honor. So even in that chapter, although we did not read verses 14 through 16, Jesus says, do your praying in private. Don't bring attention to what you do. But then Jesus also says, do not cover your light. So it's a little more complicated here. So what is Jesus saying to us this evening? Well, perhaps Ash Wednesday is too much of a ritual uh, to, to devote efforts to, to the kinds of paradoxes that Jesus is always seeming to throw in our laps. Things like, be a light to the world, but don't be a stage hog. Give, but not as a means of boasting. Pray, but not as a means of calling attention to oneself. When I was uh, I was working in the finance business, I had to take an uh, insurance seminar one weekend, and uh, it was all it was a Friday evening, Saturday, and, uh, and half a day Sunday. And it was in a hotel, and I was having lunch in the hotel one day. And it was Sunday. We had to finish this class on a Sunday. I was attending church, but this was, you know, I had to go to this, finish this insurance class. And there was a church group that had just come in. They were having lunch in that restaurant. And I remember it was, you know, probably 10, 12 nice church folks. And the man got up and made a big deal about saying the blessing. I mean... My wife and I say grace every time we go into a restaurant. But I always try to be somewhat discreet. Not that I'm ashamed of it, but I don't necessarily need to call my attention to it. If people pay attention to see, that's fine. But he made a big show, and it was like, you know, I guess, you know, it, it was just a huge production. And it turned me off a little bit, but then I thought, well, you know, if that works for him, fine. But I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing if, it, it's a bad thing if the attention to the one praying is the focus. The focus has to be on God. Jesus says, be a light to the world, but don't hog the stage. He says, give, but don't boast. He says, pray, but don't call attention to yourself. And so that is the challenge for us as we enter into this Lenten project. You know, when we announce how much money a certain project raised and we announce it during church, how do we prevent coming across as just a little bit of thump in our chest? I don't think we really do that, but if we're not careful, it can, it can cross over into vanity. So we have to be aware that everything we do comes from God. When someone says to me after, uh, on that rare occasion when someone says to me after a sermon, Pastor, that was a great sermon, uh, I have to be careful to remember 
give it all back to God. If anything that I ever say up here touches your heart, it doesn't come from me, it comes from God. And we have to understand that. Because we can't do anything apart from Christ, apart from God. And that is one thing we try to focus on with this Ash Wednesday preparation as we enter into Lent. So here is the dilemma we all face. How can we demonstrate our faith without making it all about us, but about God? How do we demonstrate the light while at the same time helping everyone understand that it's not about me, it's not about me, it is about God. For Ash Wednesday, if not for the cross, we put our heads with the person waiting upon us. Well, let me start over. If, if we don't put the cross on our heads this time, <laughs> Will the person in the grocery store know that we do follow Christ and are open to their questions? In other words, we don't have to wear a cross of ashes in public for people to know we're Christians. But if the ashes aren't there, will they know there's something different about us? Someone might see ashes on your head and say, hey, tell me about that. And you might be thinking, I better wipe those things off before I go inside because I don't want anybody talking to me about my faith. But you will find out that when you go, if you go out in public and, and your ashes are still on, somebody might ask you a question. Now, it's not a good or bad thing to be asked questions, but it might inform your faith if you think, Oh, I better take these ashes off because I sure don't want to explain this. We shouldn't feel reluctant to explain why we do what we do. And if, if I don't preach that there is great value in following the discipline of stewardship by sharing my own story of giving, not to puff myself up, but to point to God, how will the gathered community know what to do with their own desire to give? If we do not demonstrate that, that, that we practice the gift of prayer or the value of a small group experience, how can we expect them to know just how valuable a gift it is? So we have to speak about these things. We have to teach about these things. But we always have to keep God in the number one position. The way I like to think about the, the paradox and dilemma of Scripture such as this is simple. Beware the trap of ego. There, there's a fine line between something being a healthy ritual or activity and something being an unhealthy ritual or activity. The path toward becoming a hypocrite is not easily identified until we are often well over the line. <laughs> Crossing the line goes both ways. From failing to demonstrate our love of God sufficiently so that all see God, to being so over the top that the focus points to me rather than God. So what do we do? What do we take away from this scripture? and put on our to-do, or perhaps more accurately, our to-be list for limit. Well, three things very briefly. First, be authentic. Don't do things for show. If we're ready to pray, then pray. Don't hold it in, even if we're in the middle of the, standing in the middle of the grocery store and, and, and we're with a child who's having a meltdown. The key is that we aren't doing the prayer to show others how pious we are. We are praying because we lean upon God in all times. But let's also be honest. Jesus wants deep, abiding prayer out of us. Not just emergency prayers. A time when we put away all our requests and listen. A time of not trying to affect God with our prayer, but letting God affect us through our time of praying. 
Prayer should be more about changing our heart toward God than trying to change God's mind. That can come only when we shut out all of the busyness of our lives with all its noise, hearing the voice of God that is usually drowned out by all the chatter around us. You need some quiet. You need some space. You need a place where you can block everything out. And it comes about when we finally can think of nothing more to talk with God about, and then we let the creator of all things get a word in. If you're praying so much and God can't get a word in edgewise, then maybe you need to stop talking and you need to listen. And maybe God won't speak your name out loud in plain English, but I suspect if you wait long enough, You'll start feeling some kind of nudge from God. You may not be able to explain it. You may even question it. You may even think you've lost your mind. But the problem with most of our prayer life is we talk so much. We don't bother to listen. Well, second, we're called to use our bodies more effectively as a means of getting closer to God. The tradition of fasting, which is talked about in, the, in that last part of our reading from Matthew, has a historical, a special historical symbolism as a sign of remorse or a signal to God that we're in need of divine wisdom. And I know that fasting is one of those things we don't spend a lot of time talking about uh, in the church because of various reasons. Some people simply are not physically well enough to fast and go without food for long periods of time. But fasting doesn't just have to be from food. It can be from different things. Think of fasting as something you need to give up. You know, candy and chocolate and sweets, those are the typical things we give up for. <coughs> And those are probably good things for many of us to give up. But we can also think of fasting as something we give up that takes away from our time with God. Um, maybe The Bachelor's your favorite TV show. I suggest maybe give The Bachelor up for, for a minute. Am I stepping on anybody's toes here? I can say that because I never watch it. But maybe there is something you do. Maybe there's 30 minutes a day that you could give that time up and give it back to God. Maybe you need to fast from your favorite TV show. Or maybe you need to fast from something that takes away time from God and replace that with scripture reading or prayer or some other physical, spiritual discipline. The, as I said, the literal application of fasting is not necessarily strictly about food. Maybe you need to take up something instead of giving up something. Take up more time in prayer. Take up more time reading scripture. Take up more time serving in whatever way you can serve through your church. It becomes a very tangible sign that we're really willing to give ourselves up for God when we take up the fast. We find how much of our lives are lived around food more than fellowship that goes with it. We find a sensitivity to those who have food scarcity in their lives and are hungry every day and therefore we, we can better appreciate the breaking of bread and celebrate the supreme humble appreciation for that morsel given to us. Or maybe if your fast is about giving something up and getting closer to God, you can come to appreciate what that closeness means in your relationship. How that surges into your, your spiritual life and gives you energy for following Christ and being a disciple. And then the third thing we can do is remember that what we do with our money matters. And that's the third topic of that gospel reading. Not because we do it for show, but because we do it out of an attitude of gratefulness in response to all that's been given to us. 
Not for the show, but as a fellow pastor once said quite regularly, we don't do it for the show, we do it for the glow. This Ash Wednesday, let us all use this jumping off point for the Lenten season as a means of earnest and deep reflection. Let us use this time to begin practices and habits that bring life more than they bring familiarity. Let us use this time to do the hard work of growing closer to God without all the baggage that so quickly creeps in. And let us submit ourselves to authenticity, to fasting of whatever kind we choose to take up, to giving, and to coming ever closer to the one who called us into being and ask for our lives that are lived with the humility and integrity of being called servants of the Most High. <clears throat> Friends, I hope you have a plan for Lent. It doesn't have to be complicated, but I hope you will spend time about how you might get closer to God's will for your life as we walk these 40 days to the cross together. Amen. Friends, at this time we enter into a time of silent prayer and reflection. The full prayers are written in your bulletin, but you can, you can uh, I think you might go to follow those on the screen. But let us now in silence reflect on the gospel message and make our confession and our vows of repentance and new life before the Lord. Please take a moment and pray for all that's on your heart this time. Let us go to God as each one is led. Lord, forgive our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. I confess to you, O God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned through my own fault, in my thoughts, and in my words, in what I have done, and in what I have failed to do. I am truly sorry and humbly repent. Lord, hear our prayer of repentance and bless us that we might walk in the newness of the life that you offer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let us ask our Father to bless these ashes which we will use as the mark of our repentance. Lord, bless these ashes by which we show that we are dust. Pardon our sins and keep us faithful to the discipline of Lent. For you do not want sinners to die, but to live with the risen Christ. Almighty God, from the dust of the earth you have created us, may these ashes be for us a sign of our mortality and penitence, and a reminder that only by your gracious gift are we given eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Friends, in just a moment, I will come to the center here. I will welcome to come forward in a line, and I will mark you with the ashes. And as you are marked, I will say to you, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You're welcome to come as you're led, and if you cannot come forward and you need to, uh, you need someone to come to you afterwards, uh, just let us let make sure you let someone know we'll come.